literally dozens that um, specifically can fund low emission buses like we saw in Arizona, can fund biking and pedestrian infrastructure at scales we haven't seen, complete streets, safe streets for all, all kinds of things have their own programs. So um, first off, we have we just have a lot of opportunities. And so part of what we've been trying to do at USDOT is to make sure everyone has an opportunity to get in the door theoretically, but not every community may have the capacity or the tools or the grant writers or the federal match uh, to be able to actually realize that potential. And so um, that's a lot of my job, which was created by Secretary Buttigieg of like, how can we really ensure that disadvantaged, low capacity, low resource communities, those communities who've been too long overlooked um, by investments can get the support. And so we're doing that through new programs like thriving communities, through new technical assistance resources like the DOT Navigator, but even through a, a much deeper commitment to an, our equity action plan that we have at the department, which really, uh, like these movies, centers on elevating community voice. And so we've been doing a lot to really ensure that our grantees are aware of the importance of meaningful public involvement, of whose community is this, who is seen, who is feeling heard, who's benefiting from these investments. So I'll make my pitch of if you haven't checked it out, um, we have many resources through the DOT Navigator, which you can just Google search DOT Navigator, and that includes a link to our equity action plan, our Justice 40 commitments, our meaningful public involvement guidance, uh, and including letting people know you can fund community involvement through every phase of a project. We talk about a lot in the planning process, but it should and can be an eligible expense in project delivery, in construction, in operating and maintenance. Um, so lots of opportunities. The funding is there. A long time ago, I said we don't have the money in transportation. We have the money at the federal level. And so we really want to make sure that uh, we are doing all we can so every community can access that. Thanks, Marianne. I, I would just piggyback on that and say you also have a willing and excited partner in the University of Minnesota and CTS for thinking about how your communities and, and neighborhoods can access that. So thanks, Marianne. Emily, I may come to you and ask at a, at a state level um, when you think about this, and I know you work mostly in public health and think about the interactions between a variety of interconnected systems. How do you think about um, supporting the these types of projects and how have you interfaced with expanding them in the past? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about my role at the health department and how we work with different agencies at the state level and at the local level to, to implement all sorts of different projects and plans with health in mind. Um, I think one area where Minnesota has done particularly a good job is within that cross-disciplinary partnership building and coalition building. Um, a really good example of this is the health department where I work, our partnership with MnDOT, the Department of Transportation. We today see plans and policies coming out of MnDOT's offices, all, all aspects of MnDOT's offices with public health components and recommendations. And this is really exciting, but it's not happening just by, by chance. This is um, a result of years and years of partnerships that had been built starting back in, I want to say it was 2008, when Minnesota lawmakers recognized that um, in order to control public health costs, we needed to really rethink how we were funding health care, and we couldn't just rely on changes in medical care. And so um, with bipartisan support from the legislature, Minnesota passed groundbreaking health reform law, which um, created the statewide health improvement partnership. We call that SHIP. So SHIP is where I work. Um, SHIP invests in communities to do work that helps prevent chronic disease like obesity, heart disease, et cetera, uh, before they ever start. And so when we think, you know, flashback to 2008, when we were thinking about how we, how we do this, um, it's really hard for a public health agency to change people's lifestyles. We oftentimes are um, setting, uh, looking at high level policies, staying really high level. We're not as um, much on the implementation side. And so we realized that we really needed to partner with our um, friends who were doing a lot of the implementation. And so we know that uh, looking 
specifically at preventing chronic disease, that physical activity and healthy food access are the two, the two biggest bangs for our buck. And so um, diving even deeper in that, the half of the team was tasked with looking at just physical activity. How do we increase physical activity in Minnesota throughout the entire state? Um, we know that the recommendations from the, the Surgeon General are that people get about 150 minutes of physical activity a week. That can be looked at as about 20 minutes of walking a day. So in thinking about uh, access to physical activity opportunities, and then also thinking about equity and knowing that not everyone has the time, or funds, or access to a gym or recreation activities, we really focused in on transportation. If we can make it so that everyone in Minnesota has the ability to get to work, school, the grocery store, using an active mode of transportation, not only are we providing increased access to places, we're also providing opportunities for physical activity. So that's kind of where I stand at this um, intersection of public health transportation and how it impacts long-term outcomes for Minnesotans. Um, we, in terms of how we work with uh, community members, we're providing technical assistance, opportunities for funding, uh, support with submitting grant applications, et cetera. So working with cities, community advocacy groups, and then also our state agency partners. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, really echoing that importance of helping provide bandwidth to communities who we know are often, the, the individuals trying to lead those initiatives are often pulled in many directions and, and don't have the resources and bandwidth to do grants and other things. So great, another great example of that. Um, I forgot two business things before I started on questions, of course. Uh, we did start recording during the um, panel, so uh, just acknowledging that. Um, and then I also meant to say that if you do in the audience have a question, please enter it in the Q&A. Uh, Katie has already been our good model here. Um, and we I'll be jumping back and forth between those questions that I have and some that you all have as well. So feel free to drop those into the Q&A as you have them. Um, Margaret, can I turn to you at the same opening question, sort of wondering from your perspective at a local level, how is the city of Minneapolis supporting, you know, community uh, driven projects and thinking about these, you know, prioritizing projects that help us address some of uh, the concerns you saw in the film. Well, thanks, Kyle. And uh, thanks to everyone. I see a lot of friends on this. So I want to say hi to all my former MnDOT colleagues as well out there and so many other members of the community. You know, I really, I, first of all, I love these films. I just, they made me smile. They made me happy. And so I think there was a level of happiness in just watching these that's inspirational. And it made me think about, you know, what are we doing in Minneapolis that we're doing well? And part of what attracted me here to come to this role after being at MnDOT is really about the work that we do with community members, our pedestrian advisory committee, our bicycle advisory committee, the work that we do uh, in individual you know, neighborhoods and sections of the city where we're using things like our climate action plan, our transportation action plan. Those were developed with community, lots and lots of community input. Our racial equity framework that we just recently, the city council approved recently, um, is another important part of this because I think, you know, we can't separate out the ways that people want and need to travel from the history of the place we're in. And that place was redlined, that place, uh, you know, often prior, it did prioritize the car over people. And so really trying to get that balance better, uh, getting that balance so those options are available. And also, you know, one of the things I really love about working uh, in the city and working with uh, community on these issues, and, you know, we don't always 100% agree, but i Bet if you looked at it, we're like 90% agreement between things the city is doing, things the community is suggesting. And I think about things like the mobility hubs and how important those are to, to really make uh, transportation work for people. Because lots of people are going to, you know, ride transit, but then we have to think about 
you know, how are they going to get to their ultimate destination? Are they able to walk? Are they rolling because they're in a wheelchair? So our work on ADA right now too with community, you know, prioritizing a law that is been on the books federally for a long, long time. And sometimes people don't really think about that law, but in Minneapolis, we're prioritizing through uh, the next number of years. We're hoping the legislature will help us a little bit on that uh, to be able to speed up our work, but having those curb cuts in place, being able to make that a friendlier uh, you know, place to be. I think all of these things are, are super important. Um, one of them alone doesn't do it. We really have to have this, you know, multiple approach and trying new things, you know, on the, on the uh, engagement spectrum, you know, trying, trying to move more into that co-collaboration space of designing the streets of the future. I, frankly, I, you know, I, it made me want to go ride West River Parkway, but it would be really out of my way for my morning commute. Um, I'm not a winter biker yet, and I will say that out loud, but when I came to the city, I made a commitment to really try to ride my bike to work more often, and I really, I did that in the first year, and I can, I can confirm as a user being able to have safe ways to ride in the city is probably one of the number one and important things we can do. And I say, I say that from a lot of perspectives, but some of the work we've been doing more recently in downtown where we have our uh, bike path integrated into the sidewalk uh, landscape is very, you know, feels very safe and is very different than some of the other treatments we've done in the past. I could talk more about that, but I'm going to stop there. I, I just think, you know, it goes back to a, a lot of both formal community engagement, but also the informal uh, community engagement of engaging with uh, constituents and residents of the city. Thanks, Martin. It's great. Uh, and Yingling, can I turn to you? And before I ask the same first question, I also was going to highlight that Yingling contributed to a future mobility series that CTS just uh, published that I'm going to ask one of my colleagues to drop into the chat along the same lines of how do we center people's uh, experience and think about their experience and planning. Um, and I would urge everybody to check that out as well. Um, but Yingling, with that work and with the work highlighted um, in the film as well, how do you think from your research and from your experience we should be approaching these new types of projects and these new engagements with communities, what do you see as most promising and exciting in that space? Right. Uh, well, thank you for the question. I just want to take a moment to say that I'm very honored to be included as a panelist, along with uh, Margaret, Emily, and Maria, uh, because uh, you all are frontline leaders, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, addressing transportation problems that we have. Um, so I think one of the underlying theme uh, in all those films uh, is that transportation is a very central to uh, all aspects of our lives. So I think with the Emily mentioned about the connection between transportation and the physical activity, right? So clearly there's a connection between transportation and health. And we all know that there is a connection between transportation and the work. Uh, we also, uh, you know, in terms of economic opportunities that people have, and also transportation connect us with our family members, like as a mother, right, transportation enable us to care for our kids, uh, you know, and to care for our parents as well. Uh, and also I wanted to mention about the kind of the well-being aspect of it, spirituality uh, aspects of it, of our lives. Um, and because the transportation is so central to, you know, almost all aspects or domains of life, I think it's very important that uh, we uh, emphasize, uh, uh, you know, collaboration, uh, especially cross-sectoral collaboration. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think it's uh, uh, wonderful that Kyle invited Emily, you know, and, uh, you know, I think there needs to be collaboration between Department of Transportation, Department of Health, also Department of uh, Human Services, right? So when we do field work, we actually notice that a lot of the human service case managers, they actually drive their clients to, you know, to access healthcare. Uh, we, when we interview resettlement agencies who work with, uh, you know, the agencies work with recent uh, 
um, immigrants, uh, you know, refugees, they needed to provide transportation access for their, uh, you know, clients as well. Uh, so I felt like a Department of Transportation, there is so many possibilities to enable those collaborations uh, so that, uh, you know, we all recognize that the transportation is so central uh, to our lives. Thanks, Ingang. I'm going to combine two questions from the audience here, and this can be open to anybody who's interested in thinking about these. Um, both Ted and Catherine asked really great questions that I'm going to lump into design-oriented ones. One specifically about vehicles and thinking about how we design the types of things that go onto our roads. Um, and particularly, as I know everybody on this uh, presentation probably knows, that larger, heavier vehicles cause more damage and, and are more dangerous for the uh, folks who are in uh, crashes with them. Um, so that's one question. How do we think about sort of what we're, how we regulate and how we design the both the roads we're building uh, and the the vehicles using them? Um, and then also a similar question, I would say, specific to transit, thinking about how we are designing. And Margaret, I think you talked about the ADA examples in Minneapolis, but knowing that how people experience the built environment impacts how they're engaged with their mobility. Um, what do you all see either as takeaways from the film or work you're doing in those sort of regulatory design spaces that can be um, helpful as we're moving forward into this? And if you move your hand, I'll call on you. Go for it, Margaret. Okay, somebody has to start. So, um, I, you know, I really, I really like these two questions. I was looking at them and thinking about, um, you know, some of the things that can be done. I, I think that at on the issue of heavier vehicles and vehicle safety, you know, I'm going to go back to my previous role that I had as MnDOT commissioner and working on the toward zero death. Uh, work to to work on roadway safety and clearly and even vision zero at the city, um, which is another important part of our strategy. We know that these heavier, higher up vehicles are causing more damage for people. Right? They are they impact people. People are having in the crash often more death is happening. So we need to, I think, work with manufacturers, work with the federal government to, um, you know get as much safety uh, on those vehicles as possible, automatic stopping, automatic braking, things like that can help us. But we also have to think about how we're designing intersections and how we are giving pedestrians and people riding bicycles, people rolling, the ability to get the head start and get across that intersection safely uh, and really having almost, you know, I guess I'd call it the head start for, for uh, folks who are the most vulnerable users of our transportation system, very important here. Um, I, I think the other piece of it is, you know, the the question about how to you know make it more attractive. I saw that Chair Zelli's uh, one of the participants, and I know that the Met Council uh, he's he's watching. I know the Met Council uh, is a sponsor. You know, having arterial bus rapid transit where the barriers are reduced, you are uh, able to board the vehicle, you've paid already, the shelters are attractive, they're warm, they're lit. Um, we need more of that. We need we need more of the break down the barriers. You know, I really hope that in this legislative session, one of the things I am hopeful for is that maybe local units of government will have the ability to do what some communities did across the country with some of their ARPA funding. And that is either, you know, buy back from Metro Transit to have either a, a no fare or very low cost fare uh, segments, because that's another barrier. Let's be honest that, you know, it, it, it might be fine if you're commuting, but when we get Hennepin Avenue done, which is going to be an amazing roadway and transit and bikeway of the future, to get people to do their local shopping trip we need something I think that is gonna incent people and take the barrier down. So very low cost fare, uh, no fare rides, those sorts of things I think are also important in design, not just the physical environment, but also the psychological 
environment of what people face when they think about doing something different. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, you think. Yeah, I would love to answer the second question about uh, uh, you know bus bus stops and uh, how to make our bus stops more safe uh, and also improved and accessible. Well, I think that safety. Uh, one thing we talk about is that you know uh, you know whether it's safe to walk, uh, you know especially in the winter, right? You know removing snow removal and the remove those ice banks are very important for our safety. And in addition, when it comes to uh, safety on public transportation, there are also uh, you know, additional fear of a crime, right? Personal security is another important issue when it comes to public transportation. Um, so regarding uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, how we can improve and protect uh, you know, people using uh, sidewalks, the pedestrians and uh, you know, transit users, I think definitely more funding, uh, you know, and I think uh, essentially, when we talk about funding, there's a local funding, state funding, and the federal funding. I think that all three levels of government should invest in, you know, uh, uh, bus stops, right? Improving bus stops, improving our public transportation systems, right? So 50 years ago, 60 years ago, that, you know, federal government made the shift you know, because previously public transportation was only funded, you know, by uh, either by private companies or later by local governments. They consider private public transportation as a local problem. But federal government had already made the shift. And I think, uh, you know, there is a strong argument to be made that, uh, you know, all three levels of government should fund more. Uh, when it comes to public transportation. Those are important. Public transportation is not only a way of getting people from point A to point B. It's important to public space in our cities. If you think about the space that bring people together, you know, bus stops and, you know, those public transportation vehicles, you know, buses, trans, are all locations that where we bring people of different ba background together. Uh, so I think more funding is a very important, you know, and also more uh, innovative solutions. So for example, we have adopt a highway program. Can we have adopt a bus stop program where we leverage community support, right, to help us maintain, have better maintenance of uh, those important key infrastructures. Um, anyway, I have a lot to say about this topic, but I'm going to stop right there and, uh, yeah, you know, I'd love to provide more answers to that question. Thanks, Yingling. I, I would flag one thing I just be, have I just looked at this week, Metro Transit does have an adopt a stop program, uh, but it has to be one with the shelter, so I couldn't adopt my nearby one, unfortunately. But if you're near one with a shelter, I know they have a great program. Uh, Maria, I think I saw you hand, move your hand, and I was also going to add one wrinkle to the question for you. I think this question around design at the at the hyper local level, right, like the corner of our streets, coming from a federal perspective. Please feel free to answer the first question too. But I'm also really curious how you all think about impacting that hyper local environment from the federal level. Right, right. No, thanks, Hal. Um, I was going to say, sort of across all of this, I I think and I see how important data is to these conversations around whether it's design or it's regulation or it's you know what the public wants, people's preferences and choice. And I think a lot of times where we see sort of a monolithic approach, whether it's what the automakers are you know, creating and, and, and putting out into our communities or whether it's what the engineers are designing within our communities, a lot of times it's too often monolithic. Uh, in the transportation space. Um, and I think this is where, uh, you know, again, we have the federal government um, under our secretary really investing in improving data and making that data more accessible for communities so you can have better informed conversations. So for instance, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had the one year anniversary of the national safety strategy. And with that, we unveiled a whole dashboard that allows you at the very micro level to really look at fatalities in your communities, both where they are happening, but also who are they happening to so that we can see sort of disproportionately um, where in our communities, people of color who are more apt than um, white population uh, or, or more affluent populations to be in traffic accidents because they may be those pedestrians who are walking and, and are hit or the like. 
Um, and so I think, you know, we really see investing in data and making that more available, making it more usable, but also combining that with people's stories and community stories to be able to hopefully build the momentum for us to uh, understand that there's a variety of different design choices. There's a, a variety of different mobility choices that people have. Uh, I always say like transportation is the one issue that everyone believes they're an expert. And in fact, most people are experts. They know how they get around, what's preventing them from getting around, what makes them happy uh, when, when they're getting around. But then we create a process that we say, well, no, we're the experts and you need to know this information and this acronym and we have the data and we'll analyze it. And I think it really kind of creates these false choices that we see in our community. So, you know, at the department, we're working to make data more accessible. We're also, you know, working with other stakeholder partners to look at our design standards that we have in transportation, to look at uh, a lot of different factors that are going into it, whether it's in the, the regulatory and the rulemaking side or just best practices that we can help um, to make available out there. And we know there are many uh, terrific partners in this work, like the National Association of City Transportation Officials, uh, who really, I know, have done a lot of work in the Twin Cities there to, to look at ways to rethink design at this, again, very small level, but also a city and a regional perspective. So um, I get encouraged by that where I see, you know, soon we will be announcing, for instance, our Reconnecting Communities uh, program grantees. And I know even when we started talking about this program, which is to really look at ways that past and some current transportation investments have really harmed communities, have separated and segregated communities. Uh, we got a lot of pushback. The secretary, you know, was told, oh no, you know, how can you make up that there are racist highways? Well, we had our request for proposals. We received, you know, hundreds of applications from almost every community across the country. And in those applications, there was a lot of stories and data of indeed how transportation, whether it was a freeway or a railway or a port or an airport really uh, had a negative impact on that community. Um, and so again, how do we look at the data? Uh, how do we make these balances? How do we inform um, what we can do from a regulatory side or a policy making side or a programmatic funding side? So um, that's just a, a little glimpse on I think where we're at and thinking through some of these questions at the federal level. Yeah, thanks, Marianne. And speaking of data, Emily, I wanted to ask you, um, I was really struck in some of the films around both, you know, Yingling's studies, collecting data from uh, commuters and using that to inform her research, but also potentially policy. And then there were several on the public health side where it was sort of what I'm going to term citizen science. I don't know if that's what they would describe it, right? But giving communities the air quality monitors, giving communities the information they needed to make some of the decisions. Is that something that you've encountered in some of your work as you think about how public health interacts with these other pieces and and using the data that Maria and Yingling and others have talked about to help get those communities to understand and, and know what the issues are and, and how to talk about them with policymakers? Yeah, I think so. Um, when I was thinking about this event tonight and thinking about how I've recently been considering the intersection of health and transportation and the environment, I really do believe that community members know what creates healthy places. We know what makes us feel good. We know that it it's, feels empowering to be able to walk to get food in your neighborhood. And it feels really freeing to go outside and see you know plants growing and wave to your neighbors. And we know what good quality air feels like when it enters our body. And so I think that, yeah, we, we, have, the, we, we have the knowledge in our communities. We have the data. I think what we need to do more of is, I think, you know, make, making the case, being able to weave it all together. I feel like um, telling, telling the stories, so like the first story is the interwovenness of all of this. These films are a great example. There are lots of, lots of great examples out there, but being, making sure that we're um, providing access to them in communities. And then the second story being kind of that return on investment side of it. So um, being able to really talk about how the health benefits of improved access to walking, biking, and transit far exceed the estimated infrastructure costs. Um, 
we making the return on investment argument around what the actual cost of chronic disease is in Minnesota. It's, I mean, upwards of $3.2 billion a year. Um, being able to make the return on investment costs about uh, knowing that most people don't get enough physical activity, but that most car trips are under three miles and that a third of our greenhouse gas emissions come from how we are fueling those cars and those trucks. And so being able to kind of con connect all the dots and create that uh, return on investment story, because yeah, we do have this great data and it's amazing. And then the other thing I was thinking about that I love, Yingling, how you talk about in the film and in a lot of the work that you do is joy and happiness and how that is a huge public health uh, focus and knowing that like emotional mental well-being is so important and it's I think uh, it's exciting to see that how the pandemic has brought that importance into focus and so being able to fo think about how we are um, pushing the limits like when we're considering transportation infrastructure decision making I think as a public health official I can help push the limits on what is thought about when it comes to safety, accessibility, equity, but also joy and how joy is um, interwoven with public health outcomes, mental well-being, emotional well-being, et cetera. Absolutely, thank you so much, Emily. Uh, well, Yingling, uh, you correctly predicted that our 40 minutes of panel discussion would go very, very quickly. Um, but I do want to respect everybody's time. We're right at 6.30. Um, I would say if folks did have outgoing or outstanding questions, you're welcome to send them to Sam, whose email is in our um, uh, chat over on the right. Um, and we can try to connect them with the panelists um, and continue to answer those. I want to thank you all again for, thank, for joining us, panelists and attendees. It was a great conversation. Uh, and really, I, again, hope everybody enjoyed the films as well. Um, and then thank you finally to the Redford Center one more time, and then uh, to the Humphrey School of Public Affairs for co-presenting this with us and our co-sponsors at MnDOT, Metro Transit, uh, Move Minnesota and Move Minneapolis and Bike Minnesota. Really appreciate everyone's partnership and for all of you joining us this evening. And I hope you still to have a warm evening and enjoy the snow without too much difficulties. Um, and Margaret, I hope you get to take a break and also enjoy the snow and not just think about all of its impacts every day. But take care, everyone, and we'll see you again at a future CTS event. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle.